My name is Eric Mathis. As you said, I'm an assistant coach at Emory University. I'm also a program director for the Atlanta Urban Debate League. Uh, my job today is to talk to you all about uh, an introduction of critical options to the topic. And this lecture is not going to be very heavy in terms of specific critiques, per se, but strands of arguments that you should prepare yourselves for for the upcoming year. For some of you, uh, this may be a little kind of confusing because you may not have been introduced to critiques on a large scale level. Uh, for others of you who have been introduced, this will be fine, uh, but we'll give you a direction on where you should begin uh, your critique uh, research. Uh, I will warn you now, I have a sprain in the L in my right leg and I have a cold. So if I don't move as much and or my voice goes in and out, I apologize. So the purpose of today's lecture, that me? All right, sweet. So, the purpose of today's lecture um, is not to talk about critique specifics. There will be separate lectures for those. For, for example, there will be a lecture dedicated exclusively to race and identity arguments. Uh, that will not be a focal point of my lecture. Uh, I want to make sure that the person who gives that lecture has the ability to discuss that lecture in full with you all uh, for an appropriate period of time. We also, uh, like I said before, it's going to be a critical introduction to the topic. And also, we're going to have time for questions uh, and answers. We'll also discuss those who want to be critical on the affirmative things you should do. That'll come up in the AV uh, Q&A section uh, of this particular uh, lecture. Uh, and I'll try to answer them to the best of my abilities uh, with the research or the information that I have. Now, before I begin, I do have a question because I like this to be very interactive. Uh, I like to talk. I like to talk about sports. I like to talk about all things Deadpool-related and or Run the Jewels. So I have a very wide variety of things I like to talk about, which means I can talk for a long period of time. What I would like to hear from you all at this particular point, uh, I would like to see how far we are in terms of our understanding of a critique. Can someone raise their hand and tell me a part of a critique? And say your name. Yes, ma'am. Shaylee, the alternative. All right, Shaylee says the alternative. Do we all agree? Yes. Perfect. Good job. Next. Your name? Michael. Michael. Framework. Framework. Ah, uh, yes, framework. Also known as roll of the ballot, also known as framework make the game work. Yes, of course. All right, your name? Yeah. Okay, say it again. Yeah. Ria? All right. Yes, we must have a link, correct? If we do not have a link to the argument, it's kind of useless in debate. So we've got a link, an alternative. Uh, we've got framework slash roll of the ballot. Yes, sir? Uh, impact. Impact, yes. Why is it bad? All right, so we've got link, impact, alternative. Framework. Does anybody else want to add something to that? Yes, sir. Yes. Uniqueness. Hmm. Hmm. Is uniqueness a part of a criticism? No. No. Hmm. Excellent. Excellent. Critique is not a part of a criticism, and it brings me to a very important point. The next section, uh, section that I want to talk about is why the critique. Why people will run the critique on this topic, um, and one of the reasons is uh, critiques don't have uniqueness. We're going to talk about this a little bit later uh, in, in just a moment, but the reason that critiques are important, there are a lot of issues with the DA strategy for this particular topic. If you've not had a conversation about this ad on this particular topic, don't worry, you will, or, or you will have them in your lab. But I'll tell you now, spoiler alert, one of the uh, problems you will run into is there are a lot of uniqueness problems with uh, most this ads because the U.S. and China engages in a ton of engagement. We'll talk about that in a second. The second reason is that why I think it will be fertile, and I forgot to put it up here, I apologize, is the definition of what things like diplomatic engagement could be lends itself to a wide variety of affirmers. There are a couple of definitions of diplomatic engagement. We'll talk about it here, and we'll talk about why that could be problematic for your ability to have a disad to be able, or a disad strategy, disad counterplay strategy, to challenge those particular arguments. Lastly, uh, well, last two, I suppose, is uh, the deep rooted history of the West and China. Uh, that literature is very fertile. Uh, it is very strong and it is very deep. Uh, a lot of authors write about these issues to, on, a, on a massive scale. And there's a lot of intersection between those who have debated the case, your favorite critique authors, Bojard, I'm sure someone in here has tried to run Bojard, and or Gombin. Someone has probably tried to run a Gombin. This man right here is like, yes. Right? Uh, and so there's some intersection between those authors and this year's talk topic. Uh, and lastly, is that critiques 
uh, speak to a larger uh, theme within the U.S.-China debate in the context of things like imperialism, in the context of uh, anti-blackness, in the context of security, and in the context of knowing China, which is actually one of the critiques, also known as the pan critique, uh, in your particular package. So, like I said before, uh, the first issue is that uniqueness uh, issues mean that it'll be hard to win dissents. All right, my voice is not very good. Would someone like to volunteer to read this card? Well, I'm going to point someone. Yes. Engagement is inevitable. Multiple thumpers should already trigger the DA. GFT 15. China stands ready to work with the U.S. to follow up on the agreement reached between the two presidents. Within the SNED framework of strategic dialogue, we'll focus on the upcoming important agenda for bilateral ties. This includes cope and co cooperation in counterterrorism, non-proliferation, mil military to military ties, law enforcement, climate change, energy and the environment, and science and technology. Also includes Iran, Korea nuclear issue, other regional hotspot issues, and exploring the way we conduct exchanges and cooperation in Asia Pacific. Thank you. Iran. All right, now this card may not be the most recent, but I can tell you now that there are a ton of cards that are extraordinarily recent that talk about the fact that the U.S. and China love working together or will be working together in the future. This card roughly speaks to the variety of apps that have been produced at camps already. There's a Mill Mill app that was produced at Emory. There is the Taiwan app uh, that was produced at Georgetown. There is... Uh, it, bilateral ties involving counterterrorism, non-proliferation, male, male law enforcement, climate change, energy, the environment, science, technology. I'm sure the economy is going to be an issue that is also going to be discussed. So the fact that there are a multitude of ways in which we already co-op and will co-op means that when a dissent runs the uniqueness of, hey, uh, U.S.-China uh, relations or U.S.-Japan uh, zero-sum will fall apart, right? Well, we're engaging in a large way right now, so that probably should have already triggered the link. So the problem is going to be uh, twofold. The first, because the U.S. and China are kind of sort of the new Cold War adversaries who scare each other, which is what a lot of dis ads would say, uh, they seem to be able to compartmentalize situations. For example, one day there could be a cyber hacking issue that causes strained relations between the U.S. and China, but the next day there could also be those countries working together to sign a climate change agreement because they understand that climate change or disagreements in one area does not trigger a disagreement in all areas. The second is that this could also uh, this could cause teams to run more generic arguments. Since uniqueness is such a problem, you will see a lot of teams running uh, election DAs, politics DAs, agenda counterclaims, right? Well, those are great options. I think they will be great for this year's topic, but they are generic in that particular sense, meaning uh, the AV teams have the ability to prepare for them already and pretty much have a way in which they want to answer those arguments. Make sense? Okay. All right. The second one is the type of affirmance, right? So it's hard to define what uh, diplomatic engagement is. Uh, one of the definitions is that diplomatic cannot mean military, but that's a bit of a gray area because most issues involving the U.S. and China seem to involve some sort of military issue. And so a conversation of whether or not it's tea uh, could be a problem. But I actually want to bring your attention to this definition because this was produced at a camp that I thought was fairly interesting. Uh, who wants to read this one for me? Diplomatic engagement seeks behavior shifting to K9. Diplomatic engagement purpose is not to transform adversaries into allies, but to seek adjustments in their behavior and ambitions. All right. How many people think that that definition properly limits the scope of what the resolution is going to talk about? How many think that this probably means this could be virtually anything the U.S. and China want to engage in? Raise your hand high. Excellent. All right? So every camp fundamentally produces like one to two apps. Let's say there are eight camps, right? That's 16 affirmers. Here's a list that I came up with that I think under that interpretation would be T. Now, these are not all one affirmative. These are types of affirmatives. Some of them, oh, I'll just cut one off. Yeah, that's the US right? Some of them could be two-track dialogue. Academic exchanges might be diplomatic engagement if you find the right evidence based on stuff I've researched, right? This is roughly 20 plus types of apps 
that could be ran at the very first tournament of the year, and for some of you all, they may be Wake Forest University. How many people think they're going to be prepared from a DA strength standpoint to be able to answer or engage all these types of affirmatives? Raise your hand. Okay, so that's a lot, right? We all agree? So the other issue is the fact that diplomatic engagement, I haven't even talked about economic engagement, I've just talked about diplomatic engagement lends itself to a litany of affirmatives. So the way that we need to be able to beat back those types of affirmatives is to have an uh, argument that is deep in the literature about the exchanges these things do in the context of the United States and China. Does that make sense? Make sense? If you don't understand, please raise your hand and say immediately, Eric, that didn't make any sense. Uh, Deadpool said, start over. And I'll be like, all right, cool, I'll start over. All right? So the next uh, is the history of between China and the West. And this is a very, very long and rich history. Uh, this dates back to, let's just say, way before I was ever in debate, which was in 1996. Anybody born uh, before 1996? Anybody? Just me? I'm the only old person? Really? All right, sweet. Thanks. Make me feel great. Right? So, as you can say, I like to cut cards. This card isn't necessarily a card you will read in the debate, but it does explain uh, the history between the West and China to a large degree and how it intersects, right? Now, we don't necessarily have to read this together, but I do want to bring your attention to the second part of this card where it says China's dominant global position was challenged by the rise of British imperialism, which was adopted by the advanced technologies, navigational and market innovations of China and other Asian countries in becoming a world power. The British and Western imperial conquest of the East was based on militaristic nature of the imperial state, all right? How much of that sound like some critiquing stuff going on right there? Sounds like some imperialism, sounds like some militarism, sounds like some stuff we need to uh, use our caves with, right? And since this isn't a question of uniqueness, this is a question of whether or not the mode in which the app operates in is a justifiable one. Is it ethical? Is it something that we can support? If an affirmative says that we can reduce South China Sea conflict, but the method in which they engage in is something that is racist, is that something that we should be promoting? That's a debate, right? There's no yes or no to that. Some people will say yes, some people will say no, that is based on impact calculus. All right? One of the important notes about this historical domination is that the historical domination of the West versus China is not something that is, uh, all right, I wrote that down. Uh, sorry. The historical domination is not something that is separate from the present moment. A lot of the T stuff that I said before that diplomatic engagement was about attitude adjustment is a form of imperialism and an argument that we will talk about it much later, right? It is a perception that the United States knows what is best for the world, what is best for China and the population and surrounding areas of China, and that the United States knows or one needs to protect the international order, which probably best serves who? The United States, all right? So combining these points, we've already talked about the fact that it's not, you think it's not an issue, we're not to deal with the fact that uh, we are already engaged in now. That's not a question that the critique will ask. Uh, there's a deep rooted history, and that from a definitional standpoint, it is better to engage on a literature level. So now that we have a good conception of that, I want to kind of start with uh, some of the critique options that will be available to you, all right? So we'll first start with a discussion regarding uh, critical IR, uh, security critiques, and the PAN critique, which some of you already know is the Knowing China critique, all right? So the first is just a definition of critical IR. It says uh, it is the study of how we should act. Uh, I have listed here that a base definition for IR, critical IR, is it studies how countries interact, interact with one another, uh, which one of those interactions is ethical, how we, uh, should we engage based on what it is that, excuse me, sorry, should we behave uh, based on what will happen or how it will happen, or how we would like it to happen, okay? A lot of the affirmatives that have been produced so far on this particular topic talk about the fact that China is a rising threat, that China has the ability to upset the international order, that China will overcome the U.S., and that can lead to some sort of a war. Does that sound like the themes you kind of heard so far? Yes? Right? Critical IR uh, studies this particular argument from the context of how do we represent China, how do we uh, engage with China, is China a threat in the first place? The second point that I point to 
is because of critical irony arguments that it makes, it does allow for a multiple ways in which states interact with one another. Those multiple interactions fundamentally mean that there's a lot of links around for you as debaters. Okay? I don't know why I did that. All right. So the first kind of critique that you want to discuss is the critique of geopolitics. Uh, or, as some people like to say, uh, an argument that says states are not real. Uh, very similar to the security cat. Critiques of geopolitics is an argument. Uh, like I said, the thesis of this argument is that the nation state is human created. That in the real world there are no real borders that separate uh, one country from the next or distinguish one person from the next. But empirically these borders are fluid. But <clears throat> The nation state or the creation of the nation state allows for us to justify whether or not someone is considered a citizen or a non-citizen, alien, foreign, the other. The ability for the United States to say that China is a threat is because they are not American. Does that make sense? Make sense? Okay. By participating in the myth of the nation state, the link argument will make the claim that the U.S. is engaging in an act or a behavior that is unethical. So for example, if the United States gets to define China as a threat, it gets to shape them as something that is a challenge to the American way of life or to the international order, uh, which is a lot of what imperialist critiques of security will say. And that the reason that we are justifying our security stance is to do so in the context of preventing a loss of our own hegemonic order. All right. Now, places this could potentially show up. This is John Mearsheimer. Uh, he is considered the father of offensive realism. This is actually a, his picture from his website, which I thought was hilarious. Because who, who dresses like that? <laughs> All right. A lot of people will reference Mearsheimer as the justification for why we should do what it is we're doing towards China. Mirshama makes a claim that says that countries generally will try to compete with one another. That leads to conflict. That conflict will generally lead to a lot of bad things. Other people who have justified that particular rhetoric are people like uh, John Eikenberry. Has anybody ever heard of an Eikenberry card before? Right? Eikenberry uses a lot of Mirshama's thoughts and arguments to justify that. Mirshama is a political scientist. Like I said before, he proposed that. Remember when I spoke about, oh, I didn't actually. So, let's get that. All right, so for example, I believe it's in uh, the AF uh, pack, but there's an Eikenberry card from 2008, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, here it is. So this Eikenberry card from 2008, right? Here it is, at the bottom. Someone do me a favor and read right here. Of service in this dynamic emerging in U.S.-Chinese relations. China continues its impressive economic growth over the next few decades. The realist scholar John Mearsheimer has written the United States and China are likely to engage in intense security competition with considerable potential for war. Right. So folks like Eikenberry, people like Eikenberry have made the argument that in order to prevent an inevitable conflict, that we need to manage China's rise effectively. That rise needs to make China understand that it needs to conform to international standards that have been dictated by whom? The United States. A critique of geopolitics will say that Mearsheimer and those who follow him are wrong and that their use of geopolitics is a self-fulfilling prophecy. This comes up in the security critique and in the pan critique. All right. Now, here's where it shows up in the knowing China K that is in the packet. All right. It says, secure ties are IR academics and policy analysts by formulating theories, predicting the outcomes, and advocating the policy options. The distinction between theory and the practice of disappears. Proper language must be adopted for academic debate on the existence and nature of the threat posed by China. Mearsheimer does claim that this argument is based on a theory of rising great powers. In Mearsheimer's book, 2001, The Tra Tragedy of the Great Power of Politics, Mearsheimer presents his argument on the China threat issue with consumer co consummate professionalism. 
The first, the first bedrock assumptions of the offensive realism and anarch of the international system, the inherently offensive military capabilities of the great powers, uncertainty about the state's intentions, survival as a primary goal, and the rationality of state action. All right. Pan is saying that geopolitics, the fear uh, uh, and fantasy, i.e. the fear of the nation state, produces a way of understanding that suggests that China is the big bad other, the alien, uh, the foreign, who is coming to take over uh, America's teddy bear. Remember what I talked about earlier, teddy bears? Yep. And only the United States is the protector of that current order. But Pan is making the, the argument, and in this particular author, Song is making the argument, that it is fundamentally flawed. And that flawed way of thinking produces a flawed approach towards China. If you look at the notes section of the Knowing, uh, knowing China Critique, it says that the negative argument is that, in this case, the app claims to predict and interpret China creates a distancing effect between the two countries. So the U.S. is perfect, clean, does everything the right way. China, not clean, not perfect, a threat, they're evil, they're going to take over the world, and they're going to do it in an insidious manner. That distancing is problematic. All right? And it's problematic because of the stand, from the standpoint of the creation of the nation state that we presume that because from a, a national a governmental standpoint that those individuals who are in China are somehow different than those who are in America. All right? So how does this tie into geopolitics? All right? Who wants to read this one for me? Who wants to read this one for me? I'm going to call on someone. Thank you. The whole thing? Mm hmm? China threat representations are rooted in fear and fantasy, not objective reality, Pan 12. China watching in contemporary geopolitics of fear and fantasy, and in the geopolitics of emotion, French author Boyes de describes how the world is being shaped and transformed by a host of emotions, fear, humiliation, and hope. The geopolitics of emotion has been particularly on vivid display in the 21st century. The perceived, the perceived unstoppable power shift from west to east in the west in general and the U.S. in particular, a key source of anxiety has been trying to seemingly relentless rise. Too many, uh, to many, this fear based on objective knowledge is warranted uh, that the equality, that the equally impressive rise of India has not attracted on the same uh, anxiety is revealing. Uh, objective knowledge is nevertheless inseparable from emotion and desire. What we know is often uh, what we want to know. A significant portion of Western knowledge on China gained apparently through respected intellectual activity has less to do with China and more with Western desire. All right. Thank you. The knowing, or in this particular instance, the protection from China, as Pan is saying, produces a certain view that is not only problematic but creates a self-fulfilling problem. This Construction of China as a threat, as fear, so something that should be feared, is problematic from a geopolitical standpoint. All right. Now, uh, here we go. The security cut. Security cut makes a couple of claims. The first is that the preservation of a nation state is paramount. <coughs> that that preservation becomes a value second to none. It outweighs the interest of the people who live in that state and in other states. All right? Most of you all have probably debated and or heard of security okay? This is the thesis of that argument, or at least the thesis I think that you should uh, be forwarding. What do I mean by this? We have seen how this path leads to oppression of people who dare criticize the state or its leadership, and the establishment of a hierarchy where those who claim to defend the security of the state are, are given greater importance over others. In moral terms, since a nation is arbitrarily defined, the concept of national security elevates a, fiction, a fraction, or a fiction fraction, sorry, <coughs> over the real needs of other people. So, what do I mean? The U.S. or the affirmative team can say that South China Sea conflict is inevitable, that we need to prevent an all-out war between the U.S. and China, uh, and we should do that by doing a number of different things. A, is framing uh, China as a threat, as something that is violent, uh, that could upset the perfect image or the perfect order created by the United States. Uh, that can lead to some very oppressive style politics. Uh, the United States could engage in ways in which to demand that China conforms, what, conforms to things that maybe the United States may not do when it comes to things like human rights promotion or to other affirmatives that we listed uh, a few moments ago. Sorry. All right. Remember that geopolitics uh, the separation of the other or the creation uh, of the enemy. Remember that the nation state justifies, allows for us to distance 
certain citizens from being good and or bad, effective or non-effective. Okay? <coughs> that this distinguishing allows for us to create an us versus them dichotomy. That us versus them dichotomy is allowed for us to define what is a good citizen or a good participant in the societal order and who is not a good participant in the societal order. The security case says that because of geopolitics, we need to prevent rising threats from emerging and perhaps even destabilizing the world. Security critiques will question whether or not those impact scenarios of the 1AC, whether those things are actually real or not. Pan and a bunch of other authors will advocate the fact that those events are not only not real, but your creation of that us then dichotomy creates a self-fulfilling prophecy. China is not a threat. They are no different than us. We as the United States are in the context of governmental issues actually don't do things a whole lot better than what China is trying to do, and there's no reason to believe that our continuation of projecting China as a threat will resolve any future conflict. If anything, the more we talk about China as a threat, the more we talk about China being a threat to our way of life or our way of controlling the international norms, creates the problem in the first place. All right, I'm going to stop for a second. How are we doing? Good? Yes? So... Dirty Pay basically says that the Constitution is, um, is not a suicide pact, that no matter what would happen, like, they, they are able, it's able to violate the Constitution. If, if I'm not sure if I understood that question. I'm sorry. So I remember reading an argument in the past that says uh -huh. the Constitution is a suicide pact, basically meaning that, like, you cannot break the Constitution even if it means that the United States is all but does the security argue that the Constitution is not a suicide pact, say that you can violate the Constitution, just in case that the, the event that you need in order to preserve the state? I'm not going to lie, I'm a little fuzzy on that one. Uh, I think, I don't know, I think that you can, if, you're, if you're making the claim that the Constitution is a suicide pact, in the sense that we have to do whatever is necessary to preserve the United States, then the security claim would say that probably is a suicide impact, uh, but it also creates a kind of self-fulfilling prophecy that would drive us into kind of like more escalatory like wars and violence and intervention. I think, is that what you're saying? Yes? If not, then say so, because you know, I wanna, like, I, I'm not quite sure, but I think that's what it is you're trying to, at least the way I'm interpreting it. Does that make sense? So, but I think that that's a kind of a offshoot strand of the argument that I'm talking about. So that's not advice. I, what I've said is it's not to dissuade what you may have read in a car before. Uh, but I think there's a way you can frame it to be like, yes, it is a suicide pact. Uh, to defer, it is a suicide pact, you want to think of it in this context, to simply defend America at all costs. Because that means in order to defend America, we have to have an enemy. In order to know who the enemy is, we either need to create one or identify one quite quickly. So you may not necessarily need the Constitution to do that, you just need an enemy that would justify our desires to want to go and fight them. So that probably justifies why the pivot is the thing right now in American politics. Now, someone else has a question though. Okay. The security case will be big. It is always big on this topic, these kind of topics. Any topic that deals with kind of like US foreign policy relations. Uh, even if you don't want to read the K or you're like, man, I don't really like the K. As an affirmative, you need to be able to know how to answer this critique, okay? There's several ways you can do so. You can do so by saying these threats are real. Our authors are empirically, uh, have empirically studied these things. Uh, our findings are correct. Our authors are highly qualified. And your critique author does not speak to the current dynamics that occur between the U.S. and China. Even if what you said is fundamentally true, we are already at the point to where we now have to negotiate those kind of like tit for tat relationships and conflicts. All right, and what I mean by that is, if it is true that we created the threat of China, if it is true that the rhetoric is a self fulfilling prophecy, the argument that most paths will make is, well, we're already there now, so we can't turn back. So we can't go, JK, just kidding, we're good, right? China has already made security calculations based on what America has done in the past and potentially will do in the future. And it's better to manage those issues need to miscalculate and allow for something to occur uh, that could be far more devastating than China being upset that we called them a threat. Make sense? All right. All right. The pancake. 
Now, some people call it the pancake. Uh, in the bank, it's called uh, the Knowing China Cake. The pancake, we talked about one of the reasons that why the cake is such a good option is because of the historical domination of the Western China. Pan makes an argument that the historical domination of the 1AC is, not, uh, is linked to historical desires to dominate China, i.e., the present moment of power. Okay? This was in pretty much every year that there is a China topic or an issue that involves Southeast Asia or Northeast Asia or China again. Uh, this argument comes up in some way, shape, or form because generally affirmatives will start from the premise that China is a threat. Pan makes the argument that that is not only false, but is very, very dangerous and puts us on the path for the impact scenarios of the 1AC. But inside of the Pan argument, there are a couple of authors that you need to know. I'm not going to go into great details about these two uh, because, that, again, that's a subset of a lecture that requires a lot. But Spanos and Edward Said, that is not said, but Said, uh, are two authors that talk a lot about Orientalism. Uh, Edward Said talks about Orientalism and the concept of the Middle East. Uh, but in order for you to understand some of the concepts when it comes to orient Orientalism that Pan talks about, it, is, it will behoove you to study those two authors. An easy Google search with the word Orientalism will produce a lot of results. Google Scholar is your friend. All right? I also put up on the board uh, a definition of Orientalism. Uh, this is from Edward Said. Uh, I was going to post the entire thing, but it's too long. Uh, Edward Said says that Orientalism is a style of thought based upon an ontological and epistemological distinction made between the Orient and, most of the time, the Occident. This is a very large mass of writers, among whom are poet, novelist, philosopher, philosophers, political theorists, eco uh, economists, and imperial administrators, have accepted the basic distinction between the East and the West. Right? Let's start right there. When, it's, when I say the distinction between the East and the West, what does that remind you of that we've already talked about today? Knowing China? Geopolitics, right? Why geopolitics? Because, like, you're separating them to state. Right, right. You're separating who is and is not uh, a friend, who is and is not an ally, who is and is not a citizen, who is and is not foreign, okay? This comes up in the context of knowing China, as someone else just said, because the knowing China critique, we have made a distinction or an argument that China is a threat merely based off of what? They're not the United States. The United States is they, the United States most abs agree to the theory that the United States runs the world perfectly or close to perfectly, and we can't have rising powers mismanage those things. Uh, this is also under the guise of hedge good. I, he, hashtag I can bear. Alright? Uh, what is the book? Oh. Uh, between the East and the West, uh, it's a starting point for an elaborate account of concerns, the Orient is people, customs, mind, destiny, and so on. So when we talk about that, the AF is starting, I think this is a critical part to talk about when it comes to your understanding of the links for these types of debates, right? That the AF has started their discussion about uh, China as a threat and the U.S.-China relations, South China Sea conflict, from the standpoint of that there is some sort of a difference between those two countries, and they have framed it around that difference. And you as a critique, or, or, sorry, you as a critique debater should be able to exploit that based on the literature that is available to you. The strength of the pan-ke is that while some of the security answers can speak to the pan-argument, uh, the pan-ke is a very deep on the construction of China as a threat. So some of the times you will hear AF teams read their security answers to the like, knowing China pan critique, right? However, this is somewhat of a different kind of level. Pan is talking about the construction of China as a threat, not just the security K mechanics that we talked about a little bit earlier. So when Pan says things like that representation of China as a threat, right, Chan is, Chan, Chan, Pan has kind of moved beyond and simply said that it's not just a security issue, but it's also a policy framing issue about how we create or how we construct China. Does that make sense? Does that distinction make some sense? Yes, sir. So if you were the negative, how would you exploit that in a 1AC? Or 1AC, like how, or so, so, um, how would you frame the argument? Oh, okay. So uh, there's a couple of ways that you can, should do this, right? And this kind of gets into a discussion of like how to debate the case, which would be a lecture. But I'll broach it here, and you can take it back to your labs. 
in order for you to tease out or to frame the link debate, you should not read a million cards. But what you should be doing is looking for instances within the 1AC that sound very similar to the way in which you have framed the 1NC link discussion. So what I mean by that is, if, uh, what's the affirmative in the packet? Is it BIT? Yeah. Okay. Um, now, I don't want to use BIT. I want to use a different because BIT is a better example for the cap cut. Uh, let's take an argument, let's just take an IF that says uh, South China Sea conflict is inevitable. Uh, we must manage their, that particular rise. Uh, China is looking to overthrow uh, the U.S. in certain aspects of the world, and that can lead to a domination of the uh, South of South China Sea. Right? It's only kind of simple to that effect. The link, the link drawing out argument would be the AF is started from a premise that the U.S. and China are somehow fundamentally different, that America is somehow good at the construction of international order, that the United States has drawn a distinction between what a good American looks like and a bad Chinese individual looks like. And that is the framing for their policy discussion. They may say that China has done aggressive behaviors, but that analysis that China does aggressive behaviors has an assumption that America does not do ag aggressive behaviors or has not caused that aggressive behavior in the first place. The critique says that we need to understand our own relationship to how we construct China and produce that violence versus assuming that it is China independently acting on its own. Does that make sense? Right? And there's a larger conversation to be had like that. And even in the bit of if they read an advantage that it's like economic cooperation leads to spills over into like cooperation in the South China Sea, that rhetoric of South China Sea conflict can only come from whom? China. Because why would American writers or the AF say that it's America's fault? that there will be a conflict in the South China Sea? Because the obvious answer to that would be, well, why don't we just get out? Back up, get out, let's go. Right? No. We have to be there, because if we aren't there, then all of a sudden China will start to do a bunch of things that we can't, uh, we can't allow. How many people have lived in a house where their parents go, you can't close the door when you come in my house? You cannot close the door to your bedroom when you come in my house. Right? That means somebody don't trust you. I'm sorry, your, your parents don't trust you, I apologize. I know that's a, I, I, I'm sorry, I've broken that to you before. Santa Claus also is not real, I'm sorry. Uh, I, I, meant to, I meant to tell you that. Um, right, the AF makes the same assumption. The AF has made an argument that says that we can't trust China to be left to their own devices, right? Now, there are multiple reasons reason why we shouldn't trust them. Some of them could be racial. And that racism is produced from a distinction of the us them dichotomy. Does that answer your question to a degree? Yeah. All right, excellent. Uh, here and then I'm coming back here. Yes. Speak louder. I'm sorry. Well, that's one aspect of the link analysis, right? All of your authors are from a Western-centric focus, or maybe even a Eurocentric focus of America's relationship. It is one-sided, right? If you've all had a discussion about like this topic. You probably also heard that Chinese authors or media will spend that China is not very aggressive, is benevolent, and that they're nice. So there's some tension there. But obviously having evidence, if the entire of construction of the 1AC is from a Western Eurocentric perspective, then that probably lends itself to be, believe that the U.S. good, China bad, and that's an area where you can utilize or grow links out of for your particular uh, critique. Yes. All right. And yes. Um, there's a multitude of alternatives. I think that's probably a question you should ask either in lab or for the person that's going to give that particular lecture. Um, there's a lot of alternatives. Some of them obviously need to be the reject, uh, the representations of the 1AC, right? Uh, say no to the AF. Uh, there's a variety of things. Obviously, that can get played out in a multitude of ways. And I don't want to sidetrack, bless you, I don't want to sidetrack to get on that too much, but I think that's a question that you want to have in a larger lecture. I will probably tell you that they're probably the better one is that we can make the claim that the AF's engagement with China is a good idea, but the representation or the way that you have framed China, we think are problematic. And we believe that the 1AC, uh, the problematic representation of the 1AC, precludes it from being a successful strategy. So we need to rethink the way in which we do those representations before we move forward any type of engagement. Uh, in the back and then here.
what the world of y'all looks like, would you explain it in like in terms of the world or in terms of the debate space? That is a question that will be answered in a larger critique lecture about like critiques. This one is more just introductory. You can ask me that question like after this after this lecture, uh, but that is definitely a question that is not for this particular discussion. But I can we can talk about that afterwards. Okay, so hold on to that one. Who else had their hand up? Yes. So would the critique be a prerequisite to any case or any plan? More than likely, most critiques are what is considered a prior question. Right. In order for us to justify whether or not the, rep the AF impact claims are true, we need to prove whether or not their uh, ethical representations are okay. Right? Should we move forward with a policy that is steeped in racism? It's a lot of people that would probably say, "Nah, we probably shouldn't." Right? There's a lot of people that probably go, "But yeah, but you know, nuclear war and extinction." And there's most people go, "Yeah, but some people are already extinct and have already had nuclear weapons dropped on them." Right? So it's a question of. We need to understand that policy and its representations before we can evaluate its like benefits, right? It's like utilitarianism, not a good idea. Yeah. Uh, so what exactly are the reasons for why we're so afraid of China and not like India? That's a good question. I think that that's a question that the critique kind of asks, right? Like some, for some reason, maybe economic, it may be diplomatic, it may be, um, you know, it's, it's like, we're, we're really afraid of China, and we're willing to do things to pivot towards China, but you know, for some reason we don't do those same things towards India or like North Korea. Like North Korea shut off like a nuclear device, and we smooth act like it didn't exist, right? If China did that, we would kind of freak out a little bit more for some reason. I don't know why, um, but I think that one of the reasons is probably because of the way in which we have that relationship now. It could be because of the, the way in which we work together, or maybe we don't even perceive India as a threat right now because it's kind of, uh, because it is, uh, because of when we already have other arrangement agreements. But it also could be because of like the history between China and America uh, might be the cause of that friction as well. All right. All right. Last question. I'm gonna keep going. Yes. Uh, what's the main distinction between geopolitics and Orientalism? So I think uh, the main distinction between uh, geopolitics and Orientalism is I think that uh, Orientalism is kind of a dis discussion of like a certain strand of geopolitics in that particular way. So geopolitics is the construction of the nation state being false, that it is actually just made up of individuals that have constructed the nation state to justify differences between those individuals. Orientalism is more of a focus on where that distinction takes place in the Orient. Uh, Pan would say that distinction shows up within the context of US-China relations. Does that make sense? All right, all right, so great questions. All right, so the strength of the pancake, all right? And this may answer some of your questions that you may have had a little bit earlier. Uh, my voice is starting to become shot. Uh, Faith, will you read this for me, please? Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. the strength, uh, Pan 04, uh, Betts and Christensen argue the truth is that China can pose a grave problem even if it does not become a military power. Uh, the U.S. can face a dangerous conflict over Taiwan even if it turns out that Beijing lacks the capacity to conquer the island. By now, it seems that neither China's capabilities nor intentions really matter. Rather, China has been qualified as an absolute strategic other, a, discur a discursive construct, construct from which cannot escape. Because of this, China and the U.S. IR discourse has been objectified, uh, objectified and deprived of its own subjectivity and exists mainly in uh, and or the U.S. itself. Uh, such an account of China in many ways strongly seems to resemble Orientalist problematic distinction between the West and the Orient. Like Orientalism, the U.S. construction of the China, Chinese other does not require that Chinese acknowledge the validity. Okay. Thank you. So I think this is a really good card. And the reason why I think this is a really good card is because the first part of this article actually makes the argument, uh, Betts and Christensen are, are, are authors who talk about why China is a threat and why conflict is inevitable as China tries to overtake America in a leadership position, okay? So if you're an AV person, right, you want to become familiar with Thomas Christensen and Richard Betts. Betts put out an article, I want to say on The Diplomat, uh, in 2015 about this subject. Uh, and it's pretty good from an AV South China Sea conflict inevitable style argument. So that's something that you want to read up on. Pan is criticizing those types of authors who also use his whom? Mearsheimer as a justification for their analysis, okay? So the reason why I think this card is pretty good is the first part says the truth is that China can pose a grave problem even if it does not become a military power. 
The U.S. could face dangerous conflict over Taiwan, even if it turns out that Beijing lacks the capacity to conquer the island. So China doesn't even necessarily have to be a military threat or on the path to being a threat for the U.S. to construct it as a threat. Does that make sense? All right. Then the second part, in this part is China doesn't even need to acknowledge the validity of its threat. China could just, doesn't have to be like, yeah, we try to like mess things up, right? China doesn't even have to agree to it. China can constantly be like, no, we're not aggressive. Nothing we do is aggressive in this nature. Nothing that we are, we're not a threat. The fact that the U.S. continues to promote this, or in this instance, the West continues to promote it, makes the, tr makes the claim seem truthful, right? If I told you all that Santa Claus is real for the entire camp and showed you pictures, some of you might leave this camp thinking Santa Claus is real. Spoiler alert, Santa's not real. I'm sorry. I'm really sorry about that. I'm really sorry. I know you thought Santa was real. All right? So, it's how we frame them. And that framing can become a, uh, a self-fulfilling prophecy. So I do like this card. Um, I think it's in the packet. Or I may have gotten this from like one of my, my, my own personal files. One of the things that you should also do is, sorry, before I go to the next section. Uh, because Pan is such an important author on this topic, you should find these articles and read them for yourself. You shouldn't just uh, rely on the way in which we've constructed the file or how we've cut the cards, but go back through them yourself and read this evidence. All right? And if you're an ab person, you should find these authors that they're criticizing, and if you're an affirmative, cut those authors and say that no authors are really credible, Pan is incorrect, it is like none of those things are factually, or, or all things we've said are factually true. Because if you don't start, if you cannot win that the war is inevitable and that the war is not coming, it is hard to win these kind of arguments. All right, Cap. All right, I like to begin things as I always do with a spoiler alert. Um, spoiler alert: economic engagement is in the topic. Probably mean cap's going to be a thing. All right? If you didn't know that by now, now you know. One half of the topic will be devoted to economic engagement. Capitalism and neoliberalism generally are seen as generic case in this area. All right? Can someone tell me, though, what they think is the difference between capitalism and neoliberalism? I'm okay if you, like, think you know, and I'm not going to be mad if you try to answer and you say I don't know. Or I say, you know, I'm, I'm incorrect. Yes? Anybody else want to add to that? You got your hand up. Say that last part again. Person was your capital. I like that part. Yes. Not, not quite what I haven't heard what I'm looking for yet. Yes. You said one word that I was waiting for. Yes? Um, the way that I learned it was um, capitalism was uh, private, trade and, private uh, trade and industry, and then neoliberalism was where that private industry takes on more government functions, like um, things that the U.S. should be doing. Okay. So when you say, when you say, when you say uh, private functions, you're saying regulate. Are you saying that the government regulates them? More so than uh, more so than normal. So, like neoliberalism is more regulation. Is that what you're saying? 
No, no, I'm saying that um, the private industry capitalist markets would be gone for government functions. They, oh, look, they, a private, okay. I'm with the you. private becomes. You know, the private becomes the one that runs it. Yeah. Gotcha. All right. Two more. Yes, sir. Uh, I was in Cap uh, Capital more about the exploitation of the market and like using like the desire of organization into another thing. I say neoliberalism more like the incorporation of other people that don't want to be a part of it into the capitalist system. All right. And then who was the, yes. So I think capitalism is just like the system of like like a more free market and just open economy allowing for like various economic uh, allowing for like Okay, so I think we have a, a good working understanding of capitalism, but I didn't quite hear some, some of the things that I want to say about neoliberalism, and I think that brings us to this last point, which is that for some people it is a little hard to tell, right? Uh, we tend to use these words interchangeably, as if they mean the same thing, and think, thing, thing, wow, that came out, I was southern for a minute, uh, same thing, uh, and when in actuality they are kind of not. So I want to spend a little time kind of talking about this, because both of these arguments are going to show up at different times, and the affirmative, if, if you can tease out the fact that they are talking about one particular argument and not another one, it'll help you answer that argument a lot better, okay? So, is there a difference? My answer is yes, or short answer, right? So neoliberalism is a form of capitalism. I think we kind of gloss over this a little bit, all right? We all kind of agree that neoliberalism and capitalism have some sort of interrelationship, all right? Capitalism is a, a broader definition, is an economic system that revolves around commodity production like iPads, Cheetos, both of those things I assume we all love, right? And the exploitation of labor of the working class by the rich, by rich people, right? And I think that a couple people have made that argument up, that's kind of what capitalism is. Mm -hmm. all right. All right, yeah. But neoliberal neo capitalism is also centered around commodity production in a unique way. It advocates for free open markets, it usually, it's advocates usually believe that deregulation, less government involvement in the market, is a solution to most, most of our problems. It is important to understand that despite this name, neoliberalism is not the same as like liberalism in the political American system. Don't get that twisted. All right? Rather, it is a, uh, refers to, so, basically, I'll put it up here. Neoliberalism is like chocolate ice cream. Capitalism is like vanilla. Both of them are ice cream. They both could be bad for you, especially if you're lactose intolerant. And the app would probably say that these thing, two things are bad for you for a variety of different reasons. I misspelled neoliberalism. Ignore that. Ignore that I. The devil I right there. It was late at night. Right? So neoliberalism is like, let's let the private markets, as you kind of said. No, no, no. So the part that you were correct on is, is it, the private companies or private uh, regular or private enterprises, right? Private companies have them make decisions for what's best for the world. Capitalism is probably like ah, regulated cap, government control cap, government controlling of those markets is probably good. Make sense? All right. Most people generally think that right now we're a mixture of neoliberalism and capitalism in some way, shape, or form, right? I read one article um, that was too long to kind of put up here that says that neoliberalism is, uh, America is not roughly 90% neoliberalism. Not really sure how you can tell that, but I think the way in which the article kind of frames it is in context is that we do allow for private company or that a free market to kind of dictate uh, a lot of what is occurring in America today, or at least that is what the K would say. So, why does this matter for debate, right? All right. So the reason that this matters for debate, I think I'll take this out a little while. Here we go. Actually, before I go there, there's, two, there's a couple other notes I want to make real quick. So, along with along with the difference between neoliberalism and capitalism, excuse me, right? 
Uh, many state interventions, as Kate will say, may be intervening for the sake of spreading neoliberalism. Even neoliberals believe that some bare minimum regulation needs to exist. So for instance, the state does uh, things that neoliberals love, uh, using the police to protect personal property, defending intellectual property rights, getting involved when there's absolutely no other alternative. Scholars like Giroux point out that our societal protections, public housing, minimum wage, and uh, welfare state have been rapidly eroded since the Reagan era. But Ronald Reagan also increased states, the size of the state and spending of US governments. A little bit complicated. So in some ways, he's decreased the government's participation in these markets, and in some ways, he, Reagan increased them in these exact same markets. All right? Oh, thanks, whoever said 10 o'clock. All right? Um, so, now, why does it matter for today? So fun fact, if you're running a neoliberalism camp against an affirmative, and their response is eight minutes of cap good, you get to make the argument uh, with a bunch of no link arguments. You, you probably just run around. Because neoliberalism does not say that uh, capitalism in and of itself is bad. It just says that neoliberalism is bad. Right? Unregulated markets are bad. Someone give me a reason for why we shouldn't have private companies making decisions on how we should shape policy. Yes? Because they want to, private companies are aimed towards profit most of the time. So they might not have the same accountability towards providing um, for the people as much as the government might. They don't have, they might not have the same obligations, or they might not feel the same obligations to provide um, health care or like um, to an unregulated market would probably mean minimum wage might drop or working standards might drop. Okay, so, so let's talk about profits for a second. If the profit is the main goal of a business, right, what, is, what will they do to maintain or increase their profits? They will, maybe they, will, they, will, they will do shortcuts, right? You can see this in the way in which climate change works, right? They will do, envir they will do environmental harm if it means they can make more money off of the activity that they do. Who else had their hand up? Yes, you and the you. Governments can regulate mergers that corporations make, so if there's no regulations on those mergers, there can be a multitude of monopolies mm -hmm. that can, and once they have monopolies, then you can jack up prices on everything and create Right, like, so one, com one particular company could control the entirety of a particular market and set the price at such a level that it becomes detrimental to the citizens that need that product. Things like medication, for example, would be a prime example a way in which that could work in a very terrible way. Yes, sir. Um, yeah, basically, um, if the private sector um, starts to merge into um, the public sector, it will cause, um, it will basically uh, shape the regulation in favor of what they profit off of. Okay, so so let's break it down a little bit. So how, give me an example of how that could work. Oh, okay, so um, say, Say there is a medicine app, um, but it's completely fake, but they continue to, um, say they act a detail on this new medicine, um, just for the sake of them profiting off their own company. Mm -hmm. Now, um, the people that are really sick, stay sick, but they continue to make more money. Sure, right? They can exploit the system in a way that is advantageous for them, but that is detrimental to the citizens, very similar to the previous point. But yes, that's correct, right? So the reason why new, the neoliberal case run is because they believe that regulated private companies, those companies need to be regulated, okay? Because if they are not, they have the free reign to do as they please, for lack of a better word. I put this up here because when I went through the cap K file that we had, I actually thought that this card, we should kind of jot this down, was probably one of the better link cards specific to the bit affirmative. So if you want to understand how neoliberalism works in the context of bit, this is the card you need to look at. All right? And that gives you something to do in between now and say your lab when we are dismissed here in a few. Right? Neoliberalism at this point says caps works better with heavy state regulations. That's a debate to be had, right? Uh, another team can be like, no, heavy regulations are bad. Uh, we should not engage in capitalism. 
Uh, this kind of runs counterintuitive to what I said. Some bunch of people say uh, that capitalism is good, right? When actuality against neoliberalism, you want to be like, well, the alternative to neolib is heavy regulations. That's bad. The alternative is bad. That doesn't produce the kind of uh, policies that you would like it to to solve uh, the issues of the 1AC. So, but they can't say heavy regulation is probably bad because kind of, you know, they're state. All right. So, what time is it? Right. So, under neoliberalism, and in, in some ways, Cap, you should you should make the following arguments. You should you should argue that it is some sort of trade liberalization that will open up from uh, formerly protected markets, i.e., China's markets, which are protected from American influence. Right. Uh, this will open up to lead to rampant exploitation of American companies. Does that mean capitalism is bad? Maybe, but that's a debate to be had, as I said. But it does mean that huge multinational American conglomerates have the ability to put Chinese companies out of business, and that's probably bad. They can come in, direct the way that the market should look like, and it should look, look more like America, so they may say that all these like restaurants that are on like M Street are bad and should be replaced by McDonald's, Hardee's, Dairy Queen, and Starbucks. All right, I'm sorry, not Starbucks. I know how much we all love Starbucks. I'll leave that out. What was a better one? Um, fun Bucks. Yes, Fun Bucks coffee. That works. Right? But when it does that, it puts out kind of local businesses that are organic to that community, that have a bond with those individuals. It pushes them to the, it pushes them out, right? For every Whole Foods that comes into a community, a kind of mom and pop shop kind of goes away in that period. All right? This, uh, so, so the alternative. For one, leaving existing state protections that don't allow for American businesses to invade X economy is pretty beneficial. Uh, the McDonald uh, car, or, uh, this particular piece of evidence uh, says it, it would expand those markets in a way that is not beneficial to the host country, right? This gets into things like imperialism, we talked about earlier, right? The exposure of uh, another country's market to U.S. American influence is uniquely bad because of the things that it will value over uh, other things, right? We talked about it will value profits. So the food quality may not be as good, uh, the pay may not be as good, but the profits to the company will be substantial because that is what they care about. All right? All right. A little bit of time left. Almost done. This is the last one I want to talk about. Human rights promotion and imperialism. Really, this is just human rights promotion, imperialism, and cultural relativism. Uh, it's also kind of known as West is Best. Uh, and it's sort of kind of like this is a great transition for what we just discussed with neoliberalism, because the idea that the American way of life or the American vision is what is best, all right? This will be kind of like hidden because a lot of teams will go, look, we are trying to help Taiwan or uh, insert a minority group that is currently being oppressed by China, right? That group needs our help. If we don't help those people, then that will probably lead to like terrorist activity in South China Sea because that small group may all of a sudden become very radicalized, right? Who thinks that they have a problem with what I just said from a critical standpoint? If you are a critique debater, tell me what the problem is with that statement. Yes? <coughs> We probably do have some human rights violations in this, yes. Right? That's one point, yes. I would say, why is it that the West has to be the one that should be that kind of place? Why are we poking our nose in something that is probably not our business? Right? Like, who are we to decide when we should intervene in something? Has anyone asked for our help in this particular area? Is a question that comes up combined with the fact that we don't exactly do a great job of promoting human rights in our own country. Yes? Mm. Our ideas, our ideas, like mm. have. Yes, right? That is in some ways the essence of imperialism. This belief that I know what's best for you. Right? How many people <coughs> have been doing, insert any activity in your life, and someone else is trying to tell you, hey, I got, a I got something that is better for you than what you know about yourself? It's hard to do. Right? This belief that the U.S. has 
the perfect universal understanding of human rights and ethics is really, really, really problematic. Uh, there's a couple of people had their hand up. I saw. Yes, sorry. Say it louder. Right. I mean, we've all, but we also constructed that this group may become terrorists, right? Like, who thinks that's a bit of a problem that we've gone from this group, if we don't intervene, might become terrorists? What do we think of when we think of terrorists? Bad people, right? So we've constructed a group that is both the victim and someone bad at the same time which is really hard to do. We're going to go free someone who is bad. Odd. Right? Yes? Uh, I think that imperialism would breed resentment, especially if we're trampling all over their culture. And, like, the, I, I would probably look for a motive the, a Western entity might have for invading that specific area when there are so many people who are suffering in the world who don't receive aid. Like, why, why is a specific group being given aid? Right, we need to question the motivations for why we need to in intervene in this particular issue under the guise of human rights promotion, right? And so that leads me to, the way I wanted to introduce this was that potential affirmative could deal, uh, could be a QPQ where we pressure China on human rights or force better treatment for a particular group. But that forcement assumes that we know what's best not only for those people, but we also know what's best for China, as if we can tell China what to do based on our own Western assumptions, right? Who are we to tell China that they should have a McDonald's on every corner? Because America has a McDonald's on every corner. I'm not trying to bash McDonald's. I'm really sorry, McDonald's. I'm just trying to make a point, right? <coughs> or who are we to say that uh, your one-child policy is unethical? Right? There's a variety of different things that we can question about our motivations. A lot of our motivations stem behind, and under imperialism and cultural relativism, stem behind a more a, an, insidi an insidious desire to continue to control China. It is all about control. Okay? If we can find an avenue to produce control, we will probably engage in it. Now, we will use things like, oh, we're just there to help them. Oh, we're just there to make sure that that treatment lend itself to, uh, they got better treatment. But, you know, a lot of people will say that uh, the construction of America was based on an improvement uh, in the lives of a certain group of people that were here before, the America, before America was created. And a lot of those people don't exist now. But we did come over to help them. They asked for our help, right? The lives that individuals were living in Africa was barbaric and torturous. So we help them by bringing them to America. If you don't know what that is, it's also called the slave, I'm not even going to put it in quotes, the slave trade. A little problematic, right? We don't examine our own history when it comes to human rights in this country. Who are we to dictate to someone else what appropriate human rights look like? So in actuality, we are not here to support human rights, but we're here to support a version of control over the other because in our, in our own mind, if everyone is under our thumb, then we can control them and make sure they don't do anything to upset the apple cart. All right? All right. So this is another card that I cut. Like I said, I like to cut a lot of cards. Uh, can I have someone who has not read a card read this card for me, please? Thank you, sir. Uh, yeah, just from the, the, the author. Okay. Imani Franklin and Holly Federer Levin. Take, for example, the multiplicity of NGOs in foreign countries like China. You have foreign foundations giving money to organizations to bring Western values and democracy to those communities. But there are also people and organizations working abroad to fix what they're identified as problems, looking for solutions that they know are the right ones to visit the values of which they've been adopted. I think that democracy is surely better than any alternative, but here's where things get messy. These West-centric ideals that we are carelessly imposing onto other cultural contexts the notion of universal values is complicated, especially when it's related to a certain condescension that is so uniquely American. Ours are better than theirs. The more we see the parallel between our role in China and the role of many activists and communities within the U.S., we know what's best for those people. We can read about them in an academic journal, or because our relative is one of them. All right. Does that sound like imperialism to you? Does that sound like we're going to... We know what... The AV knows what's best for those people, right? 
We can't even distinguish between uh, individuals who are of Chinese descent, Japanese descent, or Korean descent. So we're just going to lump them all together. Those people because of what? We read the 1AC, or in this case, we read about them in an academic journal. I've had zero interaction with these people, but because I've read a 30, by the way, most AV teams don't even read the journal. They just go to the part where there's a conclusion, find the best part of the card, cut it, and then snap it onto an article. And now I know about all these people, right? Or I know about them because my relative is one of them. Like, I'm Donald Trump. I have two black friends, so I know about the blacks. <laughs> right? The 1AC will construct itself under a form of benevolence where we say that our Western-centric ideas need to be imposed on an inferior or a, uh, uh, what's another word that I want to use, on a not very well-developed culture. Look at China. Look at what they do. Here are the multiple ways in which they are abusive to uh, people in Taiwan. Well, the U.S. is pretty abusive to minorities in the United States. And when those people try to fight for independence, generally that ends up being very, very problematic, right? But this card, I think, does a great job of explaining, or embedded within our U.S. promotions, belief that the West is best, that our values and the things that we believe, and when I say we, I mean that relatively speaking, the things that we believe are culturally superior to anyone else's knowledge production, which just fundamentally isn't true. It gets back to the conversation my man had in the back back there when he said, uh, if all of their authors are from an Americans, or American authors who are like, I have studied these people in a book. This card says that is the, that is the genesis of imperialism. All right? Most of farmers in this area will argue that we are helping X population, but in reality, we are doing this merely because we would like to control them. If we can, if I get to dictate that the way you act is unethical, I can basically make you a puppet on a string to do whatever it is I want. But that also could lead to a lot of problematic things. But because if I can control you, guess who else I'm going to try and control? Someone else. Look at China. Look at how we made them a democracy. It's never look at China. Look how they became a democracy how they did it on their own, is how we did it. Look at me, 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 me. Don't worry about that part. Me, me, me. All right? Um, that's pretty much all I got with the exception of like Q&A. Um, I really appreciate you all for listening. Uh, I greatly appreciate it. If you have questions, I'll answer those questions now. And then at 10.30, you all are free to go back to your lecture. Or your lecture. All right, questions? Yes? What is economic rationality? I'm sorry? What is economic rationality? Economic, rationality? Uh, so I, I think in the context, economic rationality is just kind of the profit motive of economics, right? That demand, supply, dictate price, that profits. Hold up. Quiet, quiet, quiet. Uh, that economic, economic motives uh, are embedded upon a lot of decision-making calculus. So I believe that is what that particular article or part of that card was saying. Yep. Anybody else? Yes. So if we take, like, if we try to take responsibility for China's successes as a quote-unquote democracy, does that mean we also try to take like, responsibility somewhat for its failure? Oh, no, we would never do that. That's a good question. All right, listen up. Right? One of the funny things about imperialism is we take uh, credit for their successes, but who do we blame for their failures? You blame China. China, you fell off the wagon. I don't know what you was doing. You was on the right path to democracy, but you messed up. That's on you. But when China gets back on the wagon, it's like, we're holding democratic elections. Yeah, we did that. That was us. So yes, we will never take responsibility for their failure. We will always take advantage of their successes. All right? Anyone else? Yes? Oh. It's in the file, but... Right here. If you Google that, if you Google pan debate critique in Google, you will find a variety of pan K's all over the place. So that'll help you find most of the articles that have been produced by pan. 
Uh, but if you go back and read those articles, it'll be it'll help enrich your mind much more than the subject, and it needs to be fused with a reading of Spanos and Edward Said. All right. Anyone else? Yes. Oh yeah, come on down and we'll talk about that. All right, uh, I will let you out now so you can get back to your labs on time again. Uh, really appreciate your time, have a good day.